So delighted to be here again with you guys today. Introducing to you Bruce Turkle. Bruce, uh, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. You're in Miami, so obviously everything's lovely over there. Um, it's, the weather is exquisite. It's just changed. You know, we only have two seasons, beautiful and summer. And summer <laughs> has officially ended, and now we're in beautiful. So, Bruce, you're not endearing to me, me that much, <laughs> but, I, but I'll take it. So listen, let me, let me, let me throw something at you. We hear a lot about the statement future-proofing your brand. What, from your perspective, does this actually mean? And what do we need to do to get there? As a well, company? here's the simple answer. The old way you built a brand was to base it on function. Here's what I do. I'm a roofer. I'm a baker. I manufacture automobiles. I own a hotel. And that's what you would sell. And as long as within your geographic area... You were as good as most, better than some, the best of the best. You had a business mm -hmm. that no longer exists because the democratization of, of information, the Internet globalization has meant that as a company, as a client, as a consumer, I can buy what I want virtually anywhere. So building a brand based on function no longer works. If you want to future proof your brand, you mm -hmm. need to base it on two things. You need to base it on your customer, who your customer is, what your customer cares about, and more importantly, your potential customer. And then you need to base it on who you are. What do you bring to the table? Because the function part of what you bring to the table, people can get anywhere. The you part, they can only get from you. People don't choose what you do. They choose who you are. And a powerful brand based on those two things, who you are and how you make your customer's life better is how you future-proof. Then when technology changes, when offerings change, when the economy changes, people are still buying you, not what you do. So let me ask you kind of with, with the last two years, how well do you think companies have actually looked within themselves and started future-proofing their brand? First of all, you had plenty of companies who simply said, woe is me, business is over, and closed up shop. You also had companies who said, oh my goodness, this new distribution requirements, that's a real way for us to build, to build on what we're already doing. But the companies, and let's not just leave it at companies, because it's also professionals of all stripes. The ones who have really prospered, and not simply prospered in the short term, but who have who have set themselves up for future prosperity are the ones who took the time to reach out to their customers and say, we understand times are tough. We understand things are weird. Let us help you. Let us help you with these things. Not we can come over and paint your house or we can come over and install a barbecue, which might be what you wanna purchase, but rather times are tough. Let us help you. Let us show you how to maintain relationships with your family. Let us show you how to enjoy your environment if you're going to be sheltering in place. Now, as this pandemic winds down, as we have the opportunity to venture out and to start living our lives again, it's those people who have stayed in touch with us hmm. that are going to be where our loyalties lie and where we're going to find that we have common ground and the desire and the willingness to move forward together. You obviously you sold your company, Turkle Brands, five years ago, was it? Um, yes. And it was the basis for you to write your book, Is That All There Is? Um, which I know you did over the last kind of year or so. Give us a bit. They are perfect. It's like the dream snow. Tell me. <laughs> Isn't that like, wrong? It goes like that. <laughs> um, tell us a bit about it. Tell us, kind of, share us why and what all the audiences can get from it. So... I was in this position where I had started a business. We were doing quite well. I was very happy with what was happening. It was kind of my dream my whole life. I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an art director. I wanted to run an ad agency. We morphed into a brand management firm. I love international travel. We had offices in other countries. Everything was going great. And I used to get phone calls from friends of mine, successful friends, physicians, attorneys, business people, and they would want to have lunch with me. And what they would tell me was they had reached a very high level in their profession and they weren't happy. And they were looking to me for advice on how they could be happy and fulfilled. This happened a lot. I mean, I was wondering, like, why are they asking me? And what I realized was because of what I was doing, I was traveling around the world speaking and playing music and shooting commercials and doing all of this 
They thought I had figured it out. Well, I didn't know what the answer was, but what I told every one of them was, you know, people keep asking me this question. It's kind of in the zeitgeist. It's the water we're swimming in. This is before the pandemic, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you should keep a journal. Maybe you should carry a little book with you and write down your thoughts because this is gonna be of interest to other people. Okay, well, Nick, I'm a marketing guy. So at some point I start to realize, wait a second, there's a pattern, there's a consumer need here. And the truth was, I wasn't happy either. Even though I was doing what I thought I always wanted to do, I used to say to my partner, my partner Roberto would stay in the office. I would travel out, out of the city, out of the country and come back with clients. But my partner worked very hard. So driving home from the airport, I would stop at the office you know, to drop some things off and he'd be there. And he'd say, tell me how it went. And I'd say, you know, I just got back. I spoke to Nick Gold. I got good news and bad news. So Roberto would say, give me the good news first. He's an optimist. I'd say, okay, the good news is Nick has this great company. They have a big budget and they want to hire us. And we start working immediately. Roberto goes, great. He's already figuring the revenue, figuring the profits. He says, what's the bad news? I said, Nick's got this great company. He wants to hire us. He's got a budget and we start working immediately because I knew exactly what was going to happen. I had played this movie before so many times, but what right did I have to be unhappy? We were successful. I had a business, my kids were doing well. I could pay for their university. Everything was good. And that's when it dawned on me, this is something that is in the national, and as I've learned, the international zeitgeist. Yeah. If you haven't dealt with your existential issues, if you can't pay your rent, if you're deciding whether you're gonna feed your family or buy medicine, that's a whole nother issue. You have other problems. But when you've reached a level of relative success, and I say relative, look, we're not deciding between taking the Lear or the uh, Gulf Stream to Kitzbühel for the season. But on the other hand, we're not worried about the price of the rent of the heating bill. Hmm. You start to say, is that all there is? And then this pandemic comes along, smacks us all in the face or the butt and changes our lives. And coming out of it, no one's going back to business as usual. Everyone is looking for the next thing. And that's what I spent the last three years researching. You wrote, is that all there is? You're obviously living everything you want to. What's next for you? What's exciting for you? Here's what I discovered. All these things that we did in the branding firm, all the exercises work for people's lives. I didn't know that. I wasn't that smart, but we used to have clients come to us and they would say, we'd ask them, you know, they want to hire us. We'd say, well, what do you want? And they'd give us that face like, idiot, we want more business. And I'd say, okay, but let's say you're a hotel. If you want more business, just cut your room rates in half. They'd say, what? I'd say, well, cut your room rates in half. You'll get twice as many people. They said, yeah, but we'll lose money. Oh, you want more money? Yes, we want more money. Well, then double your room rates. What? Double your room rates. Well, yeah, we'll make more money per room, but we'll sell less rooms. Oh, you didn't say. So we would keep peeling back the onion. Well, all of those exercises work with people. So if you say to people, what do you want? They go, I want to be happy or I want to be fulfilled. But come on, that's like a greeting card. They don't actually know. And when you say to CEOs and the people I speak to, what do you want? They don't actually know. So the concept of building brands, which is what I did for 30 years for Discovery Channel and Bacardi and Nike and Miami. And then this concept of, is that all there is? They dovetail together perfectly. So I'm out there, well, less stages now, much more virtual, mm -hmm. carrying on these conversations, talking to my clients, playing music, giving them examples and showing them how to have the company, the business, the brand and the lives they want. Right now, Nick, I find that really, really satisfying. Chris Turkle, thank you so much indeed for your time. It's been an honor speaking to you and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. No worries.